So it's really lovely to have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, you've heard already who I am. I'm a cardiologist and a geneticist working at the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial and at the MRC London Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, I have clinical links to both Imperial College Hospitals and Royal Brompton Hospitals. And I see patients where there's a suspicion of a possible inherited cardiac condition. So inherited cardiac conditions are heart diseases that run in families. And more specifically, I'm talking here about conditions that can be caused by a single faulty gene. So almost every cell in our body contains a complete copy of our genome. So all of the instructions to make all the proteins that are the building blocks of life. Uh, and each cell has two copies of most genes, uh, one from the mother and one from your father. And inherited conditions usually arise when there's a single faulty copy of a gene encoding something important for a heart muscle cell. And we can group these conditions into three main groups. Cardiomyopathies refer to problems with the contraction of the heart muscle itself. So they're often diagnosed using imaging, ultrasound or MRI scans of the heart, which show abnormal heart size or contractility. And I've shown here uh, a schematic of two uh, different types of cardiomyopathy. One where the heart is, uh, one is dilated cardiomyopathy, which, is, which describes a heart with enlarged chambers and reduced pump function. And then next to it, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which describes a heart with small chambers, very thick walls that are hyperactive. And uh, the second group of conditions are the cha so-called channelopathies. Here, the heart looks normal on imaging of the heart, but there's a problem with the electrical system. And these are normally diagnosed using ECGs, electrical tracings of the heart. And I've put an example here where you can see a normal heart rhythm, which then suddenly goes haywire with an abnormal uh, rhythm kicking in below. And the third group are some single gene faults that don't directly affect the heart, but they lead to very, very high cholesterol levels, which in turn leads to furring up of the coronary arteries and the high risk of heart attacks. These are really extremely important health <clears throat> burdens. They affect something like 350,000 people across the UK. So individually quite rare, collectively really a big problem. And they most commonly come to public awareness when they cause uh, the most feared outcome, which is a sudden cardiac arrest, a collapse due to a heart rhythm problem. And this is a leading cause of, of death, sadly, in young people. And these stories often appear in the media. This image is reminding us of the story of Christian Eriksson, a Danish footballer who collapsed on the, on, on the pitch during the Euro 2020s. Just last week, there was a story of uh, Damar Hamlin, an American footballer who had a cardiac arrest during a game. And there are many others. Uh, and in my clinic, we see survivors of these events and also very sadly relatives of those who don't survive. And crucially, these can be preventable if we can find people in time. <laughs> um, secondly, inherited cardiac conditions teach us about genes that are important for heart function and they can help us treat other much more common forms of heart disease. So just to illustrate that, I've put, put a picture here of a, a new drug, relatively new drug that lowers cholesterol levels. So this was, was discovered by studying families who had very, very high cholesterol levels, and they were found to have a genetic change that makes a cholesterol processing protein in the liver overactive. So too much enzyme activity meant that liver cells can't remove cholesterol from the blood, and the protein is called PCSK9. So it sounds like perhaps a drug to inhibit that protein, that enzyme might be helpful, well, at the same time, actually, it was discovered some people have naturally low levels of the protein because of a different genetic change that completely disrupted the gene. So some people are actually missing a copy of this. And those people do indeed have very low cholesterol levels and they're protected against coronary disease and crucially without any obvious side effects. So actually turning off this gene and protein is good for you and very safe. So that was good news for drug companies. And there's a whole family of new drugs and indeed now some other genetic therapies that are trying to exploit this, not just in people with familial hypercholesterolemia, but in, in all people with at risk of coronary disease. So that's why inherited conditions are important. Let's now talk a little bit about the value of genetic testing. So I've mentioned many of the complications, including sudden cardiac arrest, can be prevented if we make a diagnosis early. So when we diagnose one person with inherited condition, we invite all of their immediate family to have testing and see if they're affected too. So you can imagine a family member who's had no symptoms and they're invited for a heart scan and they're waiting to hear, is it normal or abnormal? 
And then either way, they end up staying in the cardiology clinic. Well, why is that? The reason is that many inherited conditions don't actually appear until adulthood. Some come on in, their, in, in your 50s or 60s or 70s. So a normal heart scan today doesn't mean that you don't have a genetic predisposition. It's going to reveal itself later. And so this creates a lot of worry. Now, if we rewind and imagine in that first person in the family that we do genetic testing in someone who ha has the disease, and we can pinpoint the genetic cause, we find the precise DNA change that's causing the problem. Well, then instead of doing a, a heart scan in their relatives, uh, we can do a blood test, look at their DNA, and to find out which family members shares that change. And those that do, of course, we can keep in the clinic and give them appropriate care. But crucially, those who don't can be reassured and discharged, which is very difficult to do without uh, this sort of information. So having introduced these inherited conditions, let me share with you some of the big challenges we face. First, many inherited conditions, inherited cardiac conditions are unexplained. Um, so this pie chart showing the pooled results of thousands of genetic tests um, for people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they show which genes were found to be faulty in these tests. And the most striking feature here is the gray. And that's showing us that for most people, we don't actually find an answer. They're left unsure why they have the disease. Their families can't benefit from genetic testing. A second challenge is we often do find something, but we don't know what it means. There are millions of DNA differences between the genomes of two people, uh, and each one of us has thousands of DNA changes that are rare, just found perhaps in your family, maybe a few other families around the world. So a testing lab uh, won't have seen them before. They can't know for sure what they mean. So the question is, is this variant I found responsible for the cardiomyopathy or not? And the third piece of uncertainty is that not everyone who has a genetic predisposition goes on to manifest disease. So sometimes we find a relative carries a genetic variant. We keep an eye on them in the clinic, ready to act early if they start to develop disease, but they never do. And if we knew that, of course, we could spare them all that worry, countless hospital visits, of course, the NHS, we could save money on scans and things. So ideally, we want to work out which people with a predisposition are going to manifest and who won't. So there are many ways we might try and understand the genes controlling the heart. Some people study cells or molecules in test tubes and petri dishes. Some people study animals. We mainly study humans in my team. So we look at naturally occurring genetic variation in people who have heart diseases and who don't have heart diseases. So some of my team are clinicians gathering information about people's hearts and their health. Some are in the laboratory processing human samples, extracting and sequencing their DNA. Uh, but most of the team are computational biologists. So their laboratory is the computer and they're doing data science and statistics. So let's look at uh, briefly at just three pieces of research to address these three challenges that I've outlined. So the first challenge, many individuals with inherited conditions uh, are unexplained. Well, one response is to try and find new genes that explain those conditions. So 10 years ago, people living with dilated cardiomyopathy almost never had genetic testing. And the reason was because the yield was tiny. We only found a cause in perhaps 5% or so of cases. Then in 2012, a team from Imperial contributed to a really big and important international study looking at a gene called Titan, which we now know is the commonest genetic cause of dilated cardiomyopathy. It's here on this uh, pie chart in blue. And so here's a cartoon of a heart. Uh, if we zoom in, we find these um, networks of stripy heart muscle cells. And um, the stripes uh, tell us something about the structure of the cells. So this that you can see here, this, uh, this is a, a microscope image, and this is a cartoon of what that's showing. There's something called the Z disk, which is a stripe anchoring thin filaments of a protein called actin. And in between those are filaments of another protein called myosin. And the two uh, slide over each other, as you can see here, which is how heart muscle cells contract to pull the two ends of the muscle together. And titan is the protein that holds this whole contraption together. It's a very interesting protein. It's called titan because it's a monster. It is the largest human protein. Proteins are built of amino acids and your average protein has something like 375 amino acid building blocks. Titan has 33,000. It's about 100 times big. 
are bigger than your usual protein. Um, coming back to our microscope, just one molecule of titan spans half the length of this stripy unit here. So you can sort of appreciate its length just with a, a cheap microscope. Uh, you know, uh, um, it's like the Great Wall of China that you can see from space. Uh, and we all contain something like half a kilogram of titan. It's one of the most abundant proteins in the body. But because it's such a giant, it's also a nightmare to work with. It's a nightmare to analyze. It's very difficult to sequence the DNA simply because it's so large and it really couldn't be done until quite recently. So one of the things my team's been working on is to study this awkward gene. Um, we found variants explain quite a number of different related cardiomyopathies, such as cardiomyopathy that develops during pregnancy. And that works quite quickly led to new genetic tests that I think we might hear about later. And it's absolutely standard practice now to sequence this gene, to offer genetic testing to people with dilated cardiomyopathy, which wasn't done just a few years ago. The second challenge is that the laboratory often find variants that we don't understand because they're very rare or haven't been seen before. And actually, that was a big challenge in Titan, too. It's just so big that most people have a DNA change somewhere. So which changes are important? I'm not going to say too much on this because I know Debbie's going to speak to this a little. But actually, if we can solve this challenge, it really kills two birds with one stone. Uh, many of those cases of inherited conditions that are unexplained, actually, if we could just figure out which of these unexplained variants were important, that would explain another big slice of the pie, as, um, as shown here in purple. So we're using a number of approaches. We're using artificial intelligence to try and learn the differences between variants that cause disease and variants that don't. We're studying individual proteins and how variants disturb their structure and their function. But I want to briefly describe another approach we've been using, uh, which is inspired by the work of Abraham Wald, uh, who's a Hungarian Jew who emigrated from Austria just before World War II. And he moved to Columbia in the US, where he worked as a statistician for the US military. And they were looking at the distribution of damage to returning aircraft. And the prevailing wisdom was we should be in reinforcing the areas of the aircraft that were receiving the most damage, which is sort of intuitive. He had the really important insight that this is precisely the wrong thing to do. And the reason, of course, what he, what he said is, you need to put more armor where the holes aren't. And that's because that's where the holes are on the airplanes that don't make it home. Now, of course, there's an analogy there with human genetic variation. We look at the genome and we look to find the places that don't have any variation because variants aren't found in the population. They're not found in healthy people. And just like Abraham Bald needed to study lots and lots of aircraft to see where the bullet holes were and therefore see the gaps, we need very large numbers of people to see the regions in the genome that don't have variants. Um, the third challenge is why do some people who carry a genetic variant manifest disease while others don't? Well, this is, I've already described how this applies in families. Uh, we want to know uh, a family member carrying a variant, are they going to run into trouble? Increasingly, people have genetic testing for some other reasons. So, for example, someone might be diagnosed with a cancer, have testing to find out exactly what cancer type it is, and because that might affect how it responds to different treatments. And then the thinking is, should we actually also look at their heart genes while, while you're at it? We've got the DNA, we've got the data, well, perhaps we should have a look. Uh, and increasingly, people are having genetics actually without any problem at all. So now you can go into Boots, and here's an advert from 23andMe, a genetic company, between 80 and 150 pounds, you can have your genome analysed. Actually, this test only looks at about 1% of the genome, uh, but there are other uh, companies offering whole genome sequencing. Uh, and there was talk quite recently in the press about the NHS offering this as a, as a sort of fun service. So what does it mean if you have a test like this without any disease at all and find a variant? Well, there's a few approaches to try and untangle that. One we've been using is using a really fantastic resource called the UK Biobank. So starting in 2006, over about four years, 500,000 people, uh, volunteers, were enrolled in this study. They were between the age of 40 and 70. And there was a plan to follow them up for at least 30 years. And there's a real wealth of data. Uh, they had questionnaires, lifestyle questionnaires, medical history, height, weight, blood pressure, blood samples, urine samples. And every year, their medical records are collected and put in a database. And then more recently, all of these participants have had their genome sequenced. So we looked at the first um, couple of hundred thousand people who were recruited. And we found more than 5,000 people 
who have a rare variant in one of these genes that can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I can tell you there were 474 people who had a variant we're absolutely confident can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But of those, only 20 actually had a diagnosis in their medical record. Of course, the diagnostic codes might not be fully accurate, but fortunately, uh, 100,000 of those people have also signed up to have whole body imaging, including an MRI scan of their heart. About 40,000 have been scanned so far. And so we can go in, we can look at their hearts, and we can see for ourselves whether there's any evidence of cardiomyopathy. Now, this is too many scans for a cardiologist or radiologist to review one at a time. So instead, we use uh, uh, artificial intelligence and computer vision to study the images for us and build digital models of people's hearts. So this is work from Declan O'Regan and his team at the MRC Institute. And finally, I think I have just got time to mention um, a, a, an, another project. Um, we, the UK Biobank's a huge project, but for relatively rare diseases like inherited conditions, there aren't that many people with each condition. For some of the work we've got planned over the next few years, we're gonna need to work with 10,000 or more people with cardiomyopathy and even specialist centers like ours and across this whole network of the uh, AHSC. There might only be a few hundred or a low, low number of thousands of people. Uh, so we've launched uh, a web portal called the Heart Hive, which is aimed to recruit, uh, improve access to research participants for patients. So the idea came out of a, a patient engagement event. We brought people in to discuss their views and we've, it really brought home to me that patients were saying, we find research participation empowering. We can take charge of our condition. There's a lot of people who want to be involved in research, but they don't know how. So we built this portal that allows people to register themselves as willing to participate. And then it matches people to research opportunity, uh, opportunities depending on, on their situation. We then also use the portal to collect data directly from participants and participants own and control all their data and can share it with any researcher that they choose to. So from our perspective, the portal allows us to reach a much more diverse, representative group of patients compared with the very selected people who come into a super specialist centre. Uh, and this initially launched in 2019 after we ran a crowd funder and we got some money as well from Cardiomyopathy UK. Uh, and now we used it to, to run a study of the impact of COVID on cardiomyopathy when patients couldn't come to the hospital in person, but we could reach them like this. Uh, and we've got a number of studies running through this community. So. Uh, hopefully I've shown you some of the ways we're working to understand the genetic base of heart disease and bring this information straight into the clinic for direct um, patients. I should say um, science is a team sport and I'm presenting on behalf of a team. Uh, that team locally also collaborates with other teams at Imperial across the UK and across the world. Uh, and I should also acknowledge our funders who support this large uh, uh, and quite expensive program of work. So thank you to them as well.